Welcome everyone, I am the Kaiju no Kami. Today I'm going to be reviewing Ishiro Honda's 1966 classic Frankenstein's Monster Sanda vs. Gaira, also known as War of the Gargantuas. War of the Gargantuas was meant to be a sequel to Frankenstein vs. Baragon. Unfortunately, a rushed script left the film with several inconsistencies between the two movies, making it questionable as to whether it is a direct sequel or not. It also doesn't help that actress Kumi Mizuno plays the same character here as she did in the first film, despite having the name Akemi Togawa this time around, rather than Sueiko Togami. Additionally, it has been reported that director Ishiro Honda had massive issues with the film's lead actor, Russ Tamblin, who felt more compelled to just ad-lib all of his dialogue rather than follow the script accordingly. This caused great stress on Honda as Tamsin was intentionally doing the exact opposite of what was asked of him. Which is quite noticeable throughout the film as sometimes the dialogue spoken does not always match Tamsin's behavior on screen. Does this hinder the film? Or is Tamblin's rebellious persona quite irrelevant to the gargantuan expectations surrounding this movie? As always, let's watch to find out. Our movie opens with a giant octopus from the alternate ending to the last movie attacking a ship. Just as all hope seems lost, the ship is rescued by a giant hairy beast. Or at least, it appeared that way until the tentacle creature is no more. An official tries to interview the sole survivor who can only spout one word. Frankenstein. Hmm. You know what a situation like this calls for? Some John Renault lighter action. What did you see, old man? So it's a name no shikarate. He reports everything that occurred. <laughs> This leads the people to inquire as to whether or not the monster may be Frankenstein, which Dr. Stewart quickly dismisses. At least until he doesn't. This is also where things get a tad confusing as we have what is supposed to be a flashback scene to a child like Frankenstein being taken care of by a Kemi. Those of you who have watched the last movie know that Frankenstein was not actually being taken care of by Sueko until after he was already a teenager. He looks nothing like the Frankenstein from the last movie, and it is quite clear he is meant to be the creature that will become known as Santa later on. But the way they describe the situation makes it sound like this is supposed to be the same monster that battled Baragon. Ugh, this is so vexing. I know, I know, they didn't have time to actually pay attention to the last movie because it was a rush script. I get that, but come on, would it have been that hard? Did you not have 90 minutes just to spend watching the last movie before doing this one? Two fishermen find themselves to be lunched by the green beast beneath the waves before he rises out of the sea as if he is challenging the others on the peninsula. <laughs> Dr. Yuzo Mamiya, played by Kenji Sahara, heads to the peninsula, finding some residue on the fisherman's recovered boat that may lead to the identity of the creature. Meanwhile, Dr. Stewart and Akemi traverse the mountains where a set of giant footprints have been discovered, figuring they may belong to their Frankenstein and that the one consuming people is a different creature. <laughs> After all, no parent wants to believe their child is evil and doing harmful things to people, no matter how obvious it might be. While all this is occurring, the Jolly Green Giant attacks Haneda Airport, devouring people in its wake. <laughs>
Ew, didn't anyone ever teach you that spitting was disgusting? It is then revealed that the algae beast hates sunlight as he runs back to the sea after the sun is uncovered. <laughs> Stuart and Akemi return from their trip in time to hear the news and immediately head out to Tokyo. This scene is executed very weirdly, which I think has to do with the fact that Tamlin had this incessant need to defy Honda's script. Anyway, that night we are treated to a concert scene because who doesn't like concert scenes? Into space and the words get stuck in my throat. The words get stuck in my throat. It's not the only thing stuck in your throat. Unfortunately, the Green Titan doesn't show up until after she has finished her song, but it matters not because her rescue is enlightening. Big is girl! Big is girl now! Damn it! Couldn't you guys have just waited like one more minute? Now other people are going to have to suffer through the words that are stuck in her throat. Turning the lights on the city chases the monster into a forest where he is greeted by the military and their brand new heat beam firing maser cannons. <laughs> Just as the military has the spoiled beast down for the count, a brown variant emerges carrying the green one off to safety. God damn Mattel and their repaints. It is here that the beasts are named Gyra and Sanda. The next day, Stuart, Akemi, and Mamiya head into the forest to look for any cells the two brutes may have left behind, which ends up with a shocking revelation. Mm-hmm.。I see. And that is how Attack on Titan was born. Later, Stuart and Akemi take a stroll through some mountains, because I guess that is clearly more important than trying to figure out how to stop man-eating monsters. Speak of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally, Akemi somehow finds a cliff to fall off of. <laughs> because we need to actually see that Santa is indeed a good guy. <laughs> I also have to say I love how enthused Dr. Stewart is in rescuing Akemi. Okay. Oh, she's alive. Now that means I gotta go rescue her. Yep, I totally buy that he actually cares about rescuing that woman. Oh, and also all of this leads into this great scene here. We're gonna kill the monster! Hey Dr. Stewart, you're not following the script. Hey Dr. Stewart, your house is on fire. Hey Dr. Stewart, your mother just died. Hey Dr. Stewart, an atomic bomb's going off. Hey Dr. Stewart, Godzilla's attacking. I am so glad Toho went above and beyond to get such a prominent actor to be in their film. Bravo! 
So after all is said and done, and we know Sand is now the good guy, he attacks his greener clone, only for their battle to be interrupted by the military. <laughs> Following that, Gyra makes his way into the city. Word on the street is that Santa is on his way, so what does Akemi do? Try to win the 1966 Darwin Award? I better go see if she's alive. The military intervenes once more without success, leaving Santa to be mankind's only hope for survival. He chases Gaira across Tokyo Bay into the ocean where planes dropping bombs cause an undersea eruption, boiling the two giants in the process. Bringing an end to our film. A very abrupt end. But at least it's better than just the Earth randomly opening up to swallow Frankenstein. Or even just a random giant octopus appearing to drag Frankenstein into the ocean to die. I think. Is it? Despite its flaws, War of the Gargantuas is a solid piece of entertainment. Eiji Tsuburaya's effects work is as stellar as always with a lot of great detail in the miniatures, especially during the scenes when Gaira attacks Haneda Airport. That to me is probably the standout moment of the film as you get to see what it has been eating people for the first time and he looks so different compared to other monsters Toho was doing at the time. The human-esque suits are quite distinct, giving the duo their own sense of identity while also allowing them to perform actions not possible inside of a monster costume. It's just a shame that some of the effects team's work is marred by such dark scenery. Of course, having a lot of this movie take place at night also benefits it in standing out from other films. Though, I don't remember night battles in other films being this dark. Another bonus were the Mazer Cannons. I love the concept behind them, and I'm glad they are something that stuck around Toho's Kaiju franchise afterwards. The characters are hit or miss. You can clearly see Tamlin's disinterest in this film, as his body language does not always fit what is occurring on screen, which makes the narrative feel disjointed at times. The confusion between what is actually supposed to be the Frankenstein from the previous movie and Santa doesn't help matters either. Akemi is nothing more than the damsel in distress, which is kind of a shame since Mizuno has done better in the past and will go on to do better in future films. As for Kenji Sahara's role, it seems like he is only there because Toho needed to have a male Japanese lead. There isn't anything he does at all that required the character to exist as anyone could have retrieved the Gyra samples from the peninsula. It doesn't help that Mamiya is hardly present. Lastly, one cannot talk about this film without bringing up Akira Fukube's outstanding music. Like with Frankenstein vs. Baragon, being that I never saw these movies in release order, I'm unsure as to what music was entirely brand new and what was reused, if anything but that does not detract from the score one bit. Tracks like this are simply stunning as they fit the scene like a puzzle piece. <laughs> then you have a moody tune like this one. The only song that sucks in the entire film is the one the woman sings during the concert. As a whole, War of the Gargantuas was an ambitious film regardless of the flaws found in its script. It's also quite clear that the entire production team gave it their all, even though some of the actors clearly did not. Thus, I have no choice but to proclaim it as being one of Toho's finest films in their kaiju franchise if you have never seen it before go check it out right now especially because criterion has released it so there's no better time than now to check it out if you have seen it before watch it again until next time bye